much. Um, I'm delighted to be back in Utrecht and I'm grateful for the invitation because these are ideas I'm working on and I hope that I will gain from your comments and questions. We have enough time today, there should be questions. Um, I'm here suffering from influenza, so if I <coughs> don't speak uh, loudly enough, I apologise, but I think, I think my voice is coming. Um, as you will have guessed from the introduction, I travel a lot, so it's quite natural to talk about travelling concepts. Um, and uh, the PowerPoint that should have been available for you said as follows, the outline of the, of the lecture, so I'll tell you it now as an outline, so you have some idea of where we're going to. It begins by talking about Twining's, William Twining, an important professor of law in Great Britain, uh, Twining's call for a general jurisprudence, a general legal theory. It continues by asking what does it mean to say that some concepts travel well and some concepts travel badly. We then take two of the examples that Twining himself discusses at length, prison rules on the one hand and campaigns against corruption on the other, and explains his arguments. I then reassess those arguments and say what I think is needed if we're going to take this exercise of general jurisprudence further. The first thing that's needed is to separate some of the many issues that Twining is raising. A lot of too many questions are being raised at the same time. So try to distinguish some of the different questions that are raised by talking about traveling concepts. The second issue is to explain a bit better how concepts relate or don't relate to given social conditions in different places. I want to talk about that. And uh, lastly, to try and get behind who is making these concepts travel, who is making them general. We say that some concepts are more general than others, but is it a question of finding or making them? So that's the outline of the talk I'm going to be giving. Let's start with an example not from Twining, but an example of a sort of a cross-cultural indicator. I mean, we're surrounded in this globalizing world with comparisons. We see, you know, are our Dutch school children better in mathematics? Are you know, Italian families better? You know, always comparisons between different things, including law, cross-cultural yardsticks. And when we see them, we at first think interesting, may even be worried if we're not very high up on the list, and then quite often we have a further reflection which is, but it's like being compared with like. You know, what does it really mean, this, this football league of, of uh, comparing things? Is it really very useful at all? And this comes to mind regularly for me, it came again regularly because I moved between Italy and Great Britain, which are rather different societies. Um, which you know, one does very well, what the other one does badly, and vice versa, in my opinion. Um, but to say that is already to suggest that comparison is possible. And in a, a book called The World of Crime by one of your colleagues, Van Dyck, um, uh, there's uh, hundreds of tables. One of these tables is about judicial independence, and that's a pretty important topic, judicial independence. And in that table, um, England and Wales come out quite high, and uh, Italy mm -mm, comes out quite badly. You know, the first is the tenth of the list, and Italy is the forty-fourth. And you know, then I ask myself, what does it mean? Is this concept of judicial independence a hopeful one? And, and what are people doing when they make these lists up? What are they good for, if anything? I mean, I can give you any number of reasons why you could argue that judges in Italy are more independent than judges in Britain. Uh, I have to declare an interest, I'm married to a very independent <laughs> But um, what would be the, the, the arguments? I mean, judges in, in, in Italy are appointed after university by public examinations, whereas judges in, in England are appointed by 
senior judge, is the Lord Chancellor, who's a politician as well as being senior judge, and appointed from barristers who are sort of our respectable middle middle of the road, normally men, um, who seem to be, that you have, and it is true, have a much wider range of political opinion in Italy and the continent in general by appointing judges in that way rather than in the English way. Um, promotion in Italy is automatic. Um, through your career, and this is probably unique but interesting, through your career you just, by staying on, get to be a higher level of judge even if what you're doing remains the same. Your pay goes up and your official status is the same. It goes up. So by the end of your career, you're all Supreme Court judges, even if you're still dealing with local level crime. Why? Because this avoids corruption. The idea is nobody should have any incentive to please politicians in order to get promotion. So, you may think the remedy is worse than the problem, but this is the remedy. In terms of independence, it would seem to me to give them high marks. You get promotion independently of uh, anything other than getting older. Um, this independence is not really theoretical, not really as so many things are something on paper which has nothing to do with real life. It has everything to do with real life. When I arrived in Italy 20 years ago, so called tangentopoly, the investigations of politicians for corruption, was in full swing, and all the existing parties of the government, without exception, were destroyed by the judges attacking them using ordinary criminal law. And there's since then been a sort of open or semi-open war of conflicting legitimacies. The judges taking their stand and representing the state, meaning the constitution, and the politicians taking their stand, the Kabulaskoni, as representing the people, democracy. Independent from what? Um, oh, and by the way, prosecutors are in Italy, part of the judicial profession, have exactly the same guarantees. So, not only are judges independent, but prosecutors, exactly, they can't be moved, they can, subject to conditions, switch between being prosecutors, being judges, at their choice. So, again, to avoid politicians being able to uh, block things. Prosecutors are not responsible to a ministry, they are judges. Um, independent from what and to who? Uh, the <coughs> public, the general public. What the general public wants, demands, requires, worries about, is pretty important in Britain, pretty important in the Netherlands, pretty unimportant in Italy. Again, the question whether this is a good or a bad thing is a whole other issue. But it works quite well in terms of not having the sort of response to of moral panic, as it's called, to growing street crime. Judges, prosecutors especially in Italy, try and hold the line against public demands or just uh, sending as many immigrants as possible to prison. It's difficult for them to hold the line entirely because the politicians are pushing for that there as everywhere else in Europe. But in terms of independence from politicians, independence from public demand, in Italy moral panics are called social alarm, alarm as a child, and it's something that you spent your very professional definition requires you to keep at arm's length. You would think all of this suggests that they are pretty independent. And that an important public lawyer Britain called John Griffiths, not your John Griffiths, other John Griffiths, but differently, um, used the Italian case as an example of the judiciary that he would like to have, left wing public lawyer, because judges in most other places are automatically part of the social order, maintaining social order. Whereas he thought, not entirely wrongly, the judges in Italy can upend social order. And still, Italy is 44th, and England is 10th. Is it because the judicial independence that I've been describing is, understandably, regularly being attacked by the politicians who don't like it one bit. All right, it is under attack. But what's under attack is a much stronger version of independence than you like to find elsewhere. So this one example, there could be others. Anybody who studied any particular area, I suspect, of legal social life across country would have a similar story to tell about the difficulty of comparisons and therefore about what is the usefulness of these cross-cultural yardsticks which purport to be universal, to have taken an important value, an important concept like judicial independence, and to be able to show uh, cross-nationally, cross-culturally, how it varies. Which, of course, if you could succeed in doing that, an awful lot would follow in terms of you know, what would need to be changed and what would not need to be changed, what the models would be. 
Now, William Twining has um, addressed similar issues as part of his long-standing concern. William Twining is somebody who introduced the idea of law in context in Britain, the idea that law can only go into this wider social context. So he's played a very important role in this. And has a sort of long-running uh, battle, if you like, with the Oxford School of Jurisprudence, which stresses the importance of analytical jurisprudence. Um, ordinary language philosophy, clarifying the meaning of terms, and it looks very much down on anything to do with social theory, social <coughs> sociology, social background. And Twining, if you like, has, has one eye on them as the outsider, living in Oxford, but never, never part of that group. And in, in what I'm talking about today, he really has them in his sights by saying, in a globalizing world, the Oxford philosophers of law who play around with the differences in meaning of obligation and uh, uh, authority in the English language and where you get by analyzing these terms are really missing the opportunity and the challenge of facing the jobs that legal theorists need to do in uh, the wider world facing globalizing challenges. So he's written about this in the paper I'm particularly commenting on today, which is called uh, Have Concepts or Travel, Analytical Jurisprudence in a Global Context. Uh, hopefully some of you have had a chance to look at it. But also in a previous book called Globalization and Legal Theory, published by Cambridge in the year 2000, and the book that's just come out, again published by Cambridge, called General Jurisprudence, Understanding Law from a Global Perspective. So, given the sort of things that interest people here and interest the staff here, it sounded like a topic that would be worth sharing with you. What does Twining say he's trying to do, this search for a general jurisprudence? What's it about? Our increasingly cosmopolitan discipline needs to be underpinned by a revival of the idea of general jurisprudence in which generalizations, conceptual, normative, empirical, legal, across legal families, traditions, cultures and orders about legal phenomena, that these generalizations are treated as problematic, that we don't assume that the terms we're using are general or universal. Well, why bother about it? Why not just stick to our own? The ones that we think do fit our own, our own legal context, our own jurisdictions, because we increasingly want universal yardsticks, universal ways of measuring things, for sharing statistics, to know what's going on in different places, for monitoring progress, for example, in human rights, for collaborating with other societies. And a common criticism of transnational reform programs, many of which Dutch scholars are in the forefront, of course, has been that they are often driven by people who are ignorant of local conditions, traditions and cultures. Assumptions that one size fits all are a common target of the critics. I suggest, he said, that there is a conceptual aspect to these concerns. One size fits all. That one concept, one concept of judicial independence, for example, because the answer to my starting story about judicial independence might be, well, some different meanings are, are hidden behind this one term, judicial independence. His argument is it's very essential to pull out what these different meanings are because one size fits all, otherwise is not uh, allowing you to fairly uh, make the general claims that you, you say you're making. Now this exercise that Twining's involved in, of course, is not only an exercise of legal theory. People involved in doing comparative law, or comparative sociology law, are obviously keenly involved in this as well, and the famous debate about legal transplants on the one hand, you know, Alan Watson saying you can move law anywhere, it's no real problem, it's been going on for a long time. That's the way law does come about. And on the other hand, Pierre de Grand who says legal esteem, legal mentality is always deeply rooted in the culture of the place, so legal transplants are impossible. These these two extreme views about the possibility of moving uh, concepts or any other aspects of law are obviously highly relevant to the exercise that Twining is involved in. And any comparative work, whether it be criminology, criminal justice, or any other area, will very soon bring one up against the same questions. 
Okay, so that's what Tyler means by looking for a general jurisprudence. Now, what does he mean when he says that the job of those who want to pursue a general jurisprudence should be to try and understand why some concepts travel well and other concepts don't travel so well? His idea is, um, <coughs> he says, travelling well is a metaphor associated with wine. <laughs> you can just imagine, it's Oxford, <coughs> well living person having a wine metaphor. It's used broadly to refer to the transferability of concepts and terms across different contexts. And it refers not just to law, formulation of laws, law talk, but also talk about law, the analytical concept used in describing, analysing, explaining and evaluating legal institution and phenomena. So it's a sort of um, metaphor, you know, some wine, including Italian wine, doesn't travel very well, you know, it's alright in its own place, but it doesn't fit so well, doesn't, you know, it's not, not good to drink elsewhere. That's the metaphor being used here. We'll come back to later whether that's an improvement on transplants or <laughs> yet another metaphor that confuses more than helps, but that's, that's the one on the table at the moment, travel one. And what does it mean in practice, metaphors aside? It in includes exploring what it is for a concept or a group of concepts or models or frames to travel far, to travel well. That is, so they can be used with reasonable clarity and precision to express, describe, analyse, compare, generalise about, explain or evaluate the subject matter in question across various kinds of boundary. And his tests of travelling far and well are empirical and pragmatic. Does it fit? Does it work? Can the same concepts be used with roughly the same meaning in similar contexts in England, Italy, or in California, Tanzania and Japan? So, that's what travel world is about, seeing whether concepts can be used across places. Now, please note one thing here, which is not always clear in Twining's presentation, but I think is the only fair way of understanding what he's telling us. This is not the same discussion that so many of us know about legal transplants. You know, do they root or not? Do they fail? Do they, you know, do they get accepted? Can we really change other places or not? Because his concern is with the etic rather than the emic. The emic, as you know, is what people within a culture uh, think about how they talk about things. The etic is how does the outside, the external observer see things. And Twine's concern is about the communication between at the level of the etic, between external observers, who may include people within their own society, external observing the society. Can we communicate across boundaries? In other words, it may well be that um, to take traditional independence, if one would defend that, that table, one would say that the local people don't talk about traditional independence the way we do, but our concept of traditional independence is the right one, is the best one, and is the appropriate one to be used. Of course, those who engage in studying human rights across cultures regularly have to say that. They can't reduce human rights to what the local population says human rights are, or the game stops there. So Twining is not so much talking about working in the sense of has it yet worked, but by what justification we have for talking about a concept on the assumption that it is applicable, even if it hasn't yet been applied. It's not a problem, says Twining, that there is disagreement about what the particular concept would apply to. We'll see when we talk about prison rules that there are all sorts of practices in the United States, uh, maxi prisons and washboarding and death row and every other thing. But nothing <coughs> that changes the idea that prisons should have rights and there should be some sort of uh, protection of it. The fact that there's, it's a big question whether they are actually being protected or how we could protect them better. Whereas on the other hand, as we'll see with the discussion of corruption standards, there can be a point at which the concept of talking about becomes so essentially contested. You know, what do you mean by it? Somebody might even say that's not corruption, that's, you know, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And at that point, whether the concept works or not is more in question to try because 
even better, not just the local people, but even those who want to analyze it, other analysts would say that term is not an appropriate term to be using. Here's some examples of what not fitting means, not chabamal means, um, which are curious. Um, indeed, some of Twining's examples are rather a motley bunch, as many, many of you may have thought in reading it, or maybe not. He thinks, for example, that the idea of law students is something that travels very badly. Who would have thought that, given that law students are travelling around with their eyes closed and whatnot every week? Law student, lawyer, travels very badly as a concept. Why? Because if you take the way in which you become a lawyer in America and compare it with the way you become a lawyer in Italy and compare it with the way you become a lawyer in England, that the processes are so different that what will come to your mind when you talk about law student will clearly often be, if you're an American, quite wrong when applied to these other cases and vice versa. So he, he's convinced that law student doesn't travel well. The concept of rights, <laughs> not human rights, Hofgren's concept of rights, rights and powers and so on, the analytical idea of rights, he thinks travels very well. We might say that because it's so separated from any particular context. And as I'm going to talk about today, prison rules and corruption are the main lengthy examples he works through. But in, in the general introduction of his ideas, he also says that not fitting, not traveling well, means to apply, uh, for example, the concept of a chief uh, to a place which is a society which doesn't have government, doesn't have heads, as many anthropologists have discovered. All right, I can see that. But then he says, or to apply the idea of separation of powers to a society which has different types of um, constitutional traditions. Now, at that point, I'm in difficulty in following him because one of the problems which is bubbling under his work, and I'm sure you've come across it in your study of human rights, is how far, when you talk about the applicability of a concept to another society, you are bound by the fact that it actually fits current conditions or whether its whole job is to try and bring into being new conditions. So that to say the separation of powers concept doesn't apply in society that doesn't have separation of powers, I think is a bit ambiguous. I mean, Montesquieu you know, picks it up and brings it to France, claiming, of course making up a story about how it was in England, you know, but his idea of separation by saying that it ought to be, we want to have it. So the applicability of a concept, if it's a normative concept, if it's an evaluative concept, can't be reduced to the existing conditions. And therefore saying it doesn't travel well because it doesn't currently apply, seems to fall foul of the ambiguity. And the ambiguity is twining, it's not mine, because he says, in talking about travelling concepts, he's not just talking about describing, explaining what actually is the case, but also about evaluating critically. Um, what ought to be the case, and it seems to me for that purpose it would be perfectly legitimate to use the term which doesn't currently apply if you think it ought to apply. Anyway, let's move on to these two examples. Twining thinks that prison rules are a great success story of travelling concepts. In general, he thinks that prisons are a bit like airports. All airports are the same, all prisons are the same. And even though one might think that the actual use of prison as a punishment, rather than just a place to hold people, is a relatively recent invention, which it is, historically speaking, nonetheless, by now, he thinks that concept is universally understood and applicable. And his proof of this comes from two sources. The first is the United Nations Standard Minimum Rules for the Treatment of Prisoners, and all the elaborations and applications of that in the Council of Europe and Committee on Torture and various other committees that are busy trying to apply this minimum rule for prisoners or the equivalent the United States of the courts there. And a book about prisoners by somebody called Vivian Stern called A Sin Against the Future, A Sin Against the Future, Imprisonment in the World. And Twining's argument is that if you look at these prison rules, you see that they do manage to do the job which they are being asked to do. They do seem to be applicable to all prison situations. It doesn't mean they are applied. It doesn't mean prisons all change, but they all are applicable. They all make sense 
conceptually, partly because there's some care in formulating them. The rules, for example, say we seek only the general consensus of contemporary thought, what's accepted being good principle and practice in the treatment of prisoners and management of institutions. They recognise that because of differences in different places, not all the rules are capable of application in all times or places, but they hope that they will, you know, encourage people to improve practice. And lastly, they allow some room for experiment. So he thinks, you know, here's a good, a good conceptual scheme has been worked out, and uh, it travels well. Further evidence comes from Stern's book, as I mentioned, because somebody who's arguing against prisons worldwide finds herself able to use the concept of prison and to start from the idea of you know, degrading treatment of prisoners so as to show why prisons should be abolished. Basically, her claim is that there's no way ultimately that prisons can avoid degrading people. Of course, a thought comes to my mind when you, when you listen to that second example that maybe it goes against Twining's case because if the first set of rules, first example of, of minimum standards, shows how prison institution is as well legitimated, kept in being because you have a concept which is working well, traveling well in the sense that it, it, it allows you to continue to use prisons because you've got some minimum standards to legitimate it. So, well, at least if you keep that, you can carry on doing it. And Stern's book is argued you can never really keep to it. In other words, putting the whole exercise into question. So there's some tension between the two proofs that he offers that prisons and prison rules travel well. Anyway, let's move on to the corruption example. The corruption example is more complicated, as those of you who have read the paper would recall, because corruption has gone through a number of cycles in the attitude that um, scholars and others and activists have towards it. In the 1960s, let's say, political correctness would have resisted the application of a term like corruption and nepotism to, to the African societies, <coughs> on the view that this was colonialist and uh, ethnocentric and so on, and there were just different ways of doing things, and that the role of bribery, nepotism and so on, in a different type of governance system was one that had to be understood in its own terms. And there were many social scientists writing about the various functions of corruption, even in more developed countries, oiling wheels and uh, allowing for development and so on. It's all changed. Since the 1980s, the consensus has gone the other direction. It's now argued that it's almost sort of um, ethnocentric and uh, patronizing to say to poorer countries, oh, well, you've got corruption, but it's not a problem for you. Because um, if they are to compete successfully, if they are to guarantee to their citizens the <coughs> minimum standards that uh, we think they all citizens are entitled to, they clearly would have to change their methods of governance. And people from those countries are beginning to be the first to ask for measures which would allow them to have less kleptocratic governments, governments that are not just you know, taking money away from the people. And there's a new consensus as twining amongst economists, lawyers, sociologists, political scientists, and public administrators that generally speaking, and in the long term, the costs of corruption outweigh any benefits to the public interest. Well, if that's so, why isn't corruption travelling well then as a term? Certainly Transparency International, a very important NGO based in Berlin, as you know, this is the campaign against corruption. Every year has these <coughs> tables which show which country is more or less corrupt than each other country. Why is Twining still not happy? Why does he think that legal theorists have a job to do in the area of corruption? So tidying up, or more than tidying up to be doing, more than as in the case of prison rules. Well, the central puzzlement about corruption, says Twining, is not semantic. Well, there's no question of technical meaning. Nearly all usages of the term involve the idea of deviation from a sound condition. Rather, it's what constitutes a sound or normal condition in politics or public life that is contested, that is still contested. 
I mean, his problems with the definitions used by Transparency International, but not just by Transparency International, the idea of um, private interests being used in, in a public office, you know, public office being used for private reasons, is that there could be corruption also on the private side. You know, what about what people are doing in, in a private role? And that the distinction between public and private is, is made too sharp here. And anyway, people may be doing it not for themselves, but for some others or some collectivity. So the idea that just you getting private benefit from your public office doesn't cover the more extended form of uh, using your role for um, not the public interest in general, but for one sector of it. Um, Above all, this narrow conception focuses on deviance or formal infractions of settled standards by office holders rather than broader contested conceptions of public interest or civic virtue. It tends to sort of moralise and make it into a question of individual morality, something which the claims to is far more, and apparently Bentham said this first 300 years ago, far more a systemic problem. When people say we had no choice, they often are telling the truth in a certain sense that yes, everyone else is doing it. And therefore, to try and approach it only in terms of personal integrity, they may be missing what really is required to change a given system. So that the term corruption is not helpful because it carries this individual morality approach. And it's not helpful to so try for a second reason that it's too emotive, used in emotive context, and uh, its content is too much full of condemnation and too little full of analysis. To sum up, the problem where the prisoners have a right to clean water in a poor country, you know, the question of prison rules, you know, is complex enough. If, if you've got people outside the prison, can't get water. You as a government, you know, is your priority to have clean water that is in prison? Yeah, that's difficult enough, but that shows not that prison rule standards, minimum standards can't be applied, it shows the difficulty of applying, but it is, you can at least talk about it in these terms. But at least it has a clear relationship, that complex question, to basic human needs for survival and reasonable health. But the so-called problem of corruption is more complex but no less press. Okay, time is going on quicker than I thought. Um, about a quarter of an hour. Well, I'm not going to start there as well. We did start there. Can you stand if you keep going in this pace? 20 minutes? Okay, yes, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. Because I'm now moving to the second, last part of the talk, which is we now know what Twining said. Some of you already knew, I hope. Too much, what you already know, but clarify my reading of what Pilate says. You might have another reading that's was interesting. Um, now, where do we go with this? What do we, can we build on it? What do we think of it? Is he right? I mean, the examples are, 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 are not necessarily presented as uh, ideal comparators, prison rules on one hand, corruption on the other. There just have to be two exploratory examples that he uses, so we shouldn't be you know, too concerned about these examples as perfect representations of, on the one hand, failure to travel, on the other hand, successful travel, but they are. They are the illustrations that he offers us, and he does conclude that one travels very well, and the other one travels with difficulty. So I suppose we can, you know, work with them. And if we do work with them, I suppose one reaction might be, are we really so sure about these claims? Could we just as much argue that both these concepts travel equally well or equally badly? Equally well in the sense that uh, both prison rules and uh, corruption have uh, Organisations trying to spread them in different places, uh, a lot of stir about these things, a lot of talk about it, 
do change conditions on the ground in different places one way or another. Um, on the other hand, don't travel well, well that's the, the ground, the opposite of the what's and the ground, but don't travel in the sense that you know, deep down it may be that what prison rules means in Africa, <laughs> what it means in, in uh, England or America, and what corruption means in these two places are equally, in both cases, a question of the local interpretation in the light of all the other concepts, language, culture, institutions of the place. So it's not that one travels better or worse. Could argue that each of them travel insofar as they are re elaborated within the particular culture. If you really want to push the point, you could even say that corruption standards spread better than prison rules in the sense that uh, corruption seems to be much more potent at changing things. The fact that the consensus changed in the 1960s to the 1980s as Twain tells us, is exactly the proof that talking about corruption is you know, getting us somewhere. And I don't know that prison conditions have necessarily improved in, in, as much as a result of talking about prison rules, certainly not in poorer countries. Indeed, when you check the literature about prison rules, some strange things come up that are not really satisfactorily dealt with by Twain. He mentions at one point, for example, that another scholar, Jonathan Simon, who teaches at Berkeley, uh, suggested to him that the treatment of prisoners cannot be separated from the pervading ideology of imprisonment, and Twain dismisses that. But when you look at what the courts do, what the Council of Europe does, the people applying prison rules, you find again and again that the only way they can give them sense, give them meaning, is to rely on the ideology of rehabilitation. The prison exists to rehabilitate. Because that then sets the limits of what you can and can't do to prisoners and their rights, this and the other. At the same time, there's a problem, at the same time that this scholarly consensus that Twine you know, is interested in, has rather agreed that if there's one thing prison can't do, it's rehabilitate. And D. Gooding Stern, who he's using as part of his argument, is of that number. So it's as if prison rules are travelling well with a sort of ghost in the machine, a sort of um, uh, the logic behind it, which is actually one that nobody really believes in, other than the, the judges or the committee people who uh, purport to believe in it for the purposes of applying these rules. And when you look at the level of description of different prison systems, the idea that prisons are airports, quoted from Italo Calvino, prisons are airports, falls apart. There's a very interesting, as yet unpublished, paper by a man called Christopher Birkbeck um, called Imprisonment and Internment, comparing penal institutions north and south. And he worked most of his career in Venezuela, so he knows of what he speaks now, working in Britain. And he is fundamentally convinced that what prison means in Latin America is quite quite different from what it means in North America. Even different, and this is the point, from the fact that even in the United States people don't talk about prisons, as we've mentioned, as being concerned for rehabilitation, but prisons as warehouses, where things are stored, moved in and out, objects moved in and out, which is amazing enough, so far from having you know, prison rules for a warehouse. But in Latin America, the contemporary term is concentration camp or internment camp. And there are, the main difference is that there's no possibility, says Bergberg, of any sort of social engineered outcome, but even the social engineering that is a manipulation that goes into running a warehouse. Because there are chaotic places with violence and the inmates running things. It's quite a, a different setup. So, you know, if you want to make the argument for the sake of it uh, against Twining's comparing prison rules and corruption, you could make it that it isn't quite so obvious that prison as a term, prison rules as we're regulating, is equally uh, applicable and understandable, whereas corruption falls short. Indeed, it suggests that 
something about the difficulty of making progress in that sort of way, and claiming this works, that doesn't work. As if the notion of general jurisprudence, of some concepts being general and others not, is a quality intrinsic inside the term itself, rather than the quality, as I would prefer to see it, which reflects the success of people in imposing one definition rather than another. So, what are the, <coughs> the three things that need to be done to go further? Not to, to, to sacrifice what Twining is, I think, very correctly and wisely led us to, to want to worry about, but to build on it rather than this inductive way of plucking out law students, prison rules, corruption trying to, to, to give them yeah, marks, um, to make further progress about what we're talking about in order to build a general jurisprudence. Well, the first issue is in, in separating out different questions that <coughs> his adventure it seems to me somewhat mixed together. How important are concepts? And in what way are they important? How far is, is my starting problem of judicial independence having a different significance in Italy as compared to Britain, a problem of the lack of clarity of the concept of judicial independence as compared to all the other features of how Italy is a different society and the problems it's facing are rather different ones at this particular time. So judicial independence for for Italy, it would need to be different from what it is in England because of the sort of situation they're in. Um, and is, is looking at um, the difference between words and concepts. I mean, is he trying to talk about law students? Is law student a concept in the same way as, as you know, corruption is a concept or degrading tribute is a concept? So, you know, what's the relationship between words and concepts here? What about the difference between the use of words or concepts to describe and to evaluate maybe thick concepts, you know, ones which have more cultural meaning in them, are more relevant for normative judgments, whereas for description you need thinner concepts. But you know, don't, we shouldn't assume that the same things which give value to descriptive and explanatory concepts are also useful as finding things to think for evaluating judgments. Maybe you can't avoid when it comes to judging a lot of local you know, input. Um, at what point does disagreement about applicability of a term turn into disagreement about using the term at all? And he, he wants that line to go to imply prison standards and corruption, but it's not always easy to know where to draw that line. Um, Sure, we need to see the relationship of concepts to larger discourses and narratives, says Twining, but doesn't do it. Um, he also doesn't raise the basic problem of translation. I mean, translation not only is a question of language, but translation is a question of culture. It's very hard to believe that you can pursue an exercise in general concepts free of nuances of language and culture. And, and as you know, we really are in a brave new world of cosmopolitan sort talking to each other in English, but otherwise you know, whatever is produced in this cosmological language will have a highly questionable relationship to local. I mean, take, take terms like tolerance, which again is widely used nowadays, and I've talked about it when I was in Utrecht last time. Tolerance in, in Italy has all sorts of implicates and nuances and then sub-words like uh, uh, you know, guarantees for the criminal in the trial, and then whether the guarantees are too much, we need to talk about hairy guarantees, hairy in the sense of not really genuine guarantees, you know, guarantee of Pelosi. And on the other hand, uh, Gidok and the term in the Netherlands talk about particular tolerance where the government half closes an eye. Th these are so deeply part of local cultural practices that it's hard to imagine that imposing a term tolerance which is supposed to cover all places is going to be as useful as rather as I would be more tempted, get to grip with the local nuance. Twining is no fool, he, he's fully aware of the importance of ethnography and local knowledge, but the pursuit of the general jurisprudence, I suppose, in his attempt to shape the Oxford legal theorists out of their uh, provincialism, 
risks, I think, go to the other extreme of not recognizing the uh, limits on how far such an exercise can be achieved. The notion of traveling, um, traveling well, this metaphor, is a bit suspicious. Why does one not travel well? Not because in another place it doesn't fit, you know. If you could get the Italian wine, whatever the wine we're talking about, by some miracle to move, uh, teleport it from Italy to Utrecht, it would be great. The problem is the actual travelling, is <laughs> the physical erosion of the journey. That's the problem. That, that's, that has no cognate sense for what we're talking about here with concepts traveling. The problem with concepts is not the, the journey, it's the applicability. So we're much nearer to the old discourse using the metaphor of legal transplants, and God knows that's problematic enough as a metaphor because law is not, it's not a, either a medical or a botanic transplant. But at least, at least there you have the sense of can the thing which grew in one place grow in another? Traveling well metaphor, to be frank, doesn't seem to be terribly helpful. The second set of questions, of course, has to do with conditions. How do concepts relate to conditions? Maybe corruption, if we allow Twining's argument, corruption travels less well because it's a term which leads to a whole wider society, politics, society, economics, whereas prison rules are more localised, circumscribed, just a question of a particular institution. So maybe that's relevant, you know, what are, what's the extent of the wider conditions to which a term relates. What about the conditions which make something work? In other words, how far it's been legalized, professionalized, managerialized. If you study the, the story that people tell about the way prison rules spread around, it has an awful lot to do with the profession of those who work in prisons. It has also to do with litigation against them, in America especially, with the result that a new form of prison service developed from you know, more modernized, more concerned with managerial standards which then can defend them from criticism by those trying to impose prison rules. And this does spread around the world through professional interconnections. And with corruption, that sort of profession hasn't yet arisen. So yes, um, that would be a, a worthwhile line to look at. Why and how do you get a, a profession building on a particular concept and, and sharing uh, categories and tying those categories across country. So what's being regulated and difficulty of regulating it and who's doing the regulation is, is certainly important. Prison rules ennobled uh, the prison officer profession uh, and managerialness is the other side of Prison, the success of prison rule concepts, for better or worse, it was able to be, the prisons were made more subject to managerial standards. Finally, what about, and this leads to the final point, what about who lies behind uh, the pressure to make particular terms in general, the making of the term. It's interesting that Twiney never uses the word resistance, and it's hard for a social theorist to, to read this and think, well, you know, what's general, what's good for some is bad for others. You know, some might not like the spreading of particular terms, and indeed it's highly questionable. Take zero tolerance in the criminological literature. There's lots of writing about how the term zero tolerance spread from the United States to Britain, no doubt also to the Netherlands, and that's a bad thing for us left-wing criminologists. Um, so the general concept isn't necessarily a good thing, traveling well, you know, who wants it? Of course, even there it's more complicated because uh, some feminists introduce zero tolerance about male violence and we're happy to have that terminology. So it's 
not so simple, depends, not on the generality of concept, not what makes it good. Uh, what is, makes it good is whether it's useful in particular circumstances. So some people are writing about the dangers of zero tolerance spreading around the world, others are writing about the difficulties of making human rights spread around the world. So the question of whether you want them to be general or not, and who's trying to, what networks, what epistemic communities are behind this, must be the central question. I agree that it doesn't um, solve the normative question uh, that sometimes Twine seems to be raising, which is normatively it, we should be able to give an answer to whether the prisoner in a poor country is entitled to water, even if the people outside can't have easy access to it. I agree that switching the discourse you know, in a sociological way and saying, well, let's see who's behind, who's pushing things, will not, of course, answer that normative question. But that normative question seems to be inseparable from <coughs> the, the intellectual issue of why some concepts are or are not general. So, I think I've more or less told you all that I, I wanted to say. Um, Twining himself ends by saying, by quoting Clifford Geertz, who's a anthropologist highly sensitive to difference, not to generalities. Um, he wrote a famous piece about being an anti anti relativist, that you know, should be frightened of. Relativism, as people often are, one should, their places are often different, do live in their own worlds. But Twining ends quoting Geertz by saying, we should not mistake the conversions of vocabularies for the conversions of views. Right. But if that's so, if using the same terms, if using the same concepts, doesn't necessarily have to mean the same thing, and that's right, just think of the way democracy or other community, other terms, English terms often, are used by people with very different political views, and therefore they must mean different things, or in very different political circumstances. How Putin and the Georgians each managed to accuse each other of ethnic cleansing, or genocide, or whatever. The fact that terms are being used doesn't, I think, um, get us as far as Twining seems to think it would do. If he himself says convergence of vocabularies doesn't indicate convergence of views, and you could have get to the same place with different conceptual categories, but still reach the same pragmatic solutions, because that's the converse, then quite why is it so important to be able to develop a general jurisprudence? <coughs>